In the late 1970s, Digital Equipment Corporation followed the PDP-11 architecture with the VAX-11 architecture. It was an extension of the original underlying concepts of the PDP-11. It was introduced in late 1977, and the first model was the VAX-11-780, uh, which mainly came out in 1978. The PDP-11 was a 16-bit address machine. The VAX was a 32-bit address machine. The PDP-11 had eight registers. The VAX had 16. The PDP-11 had eight addressing modes. The VAX has or had um, 16. Um, the number of instructions was vastly larger in the VAX. It was a, it was a much larger concept machine. Many, many more instructions. What you're looking at here uh, and by the way, that was ultimately its its downfall, whereas it had so many addressing modes, modes and so many instructions, it was virtually impossible to write a decent compiler for it. The compilers could never take advantage of all of the features the machine had. So if you were writing programs in Fortran or um, actually was PL1 available uh, or any of the high level languages that were available back then, uh, your compiler was not really using all the facilities of the machine, so a lot of it went to waste. Uh, it had an exotic uh, virtual memory scheme. Um, it was it was a very imaginative machine, but it was uh, coming out at the time when uh, people were beginning to move towards RISC architectures, which the early and uh, late 80s had plenty of, and it was a very expensive machine to build. Um, the backplane on it, the SBA, SBA bus, uh, was a nightmare of wiring. Um, this uh, was it was kind of the wrong machine for the wrong time. But anyway, it was a very interesting machine. This is the layout of an instruction on the PD on the VAX 11. It's similar to the layout on a PDP 11. Now remember that the byte addressed is the uh, low order byte. So this would be the byte addressed down here on the right hand side. These would be successively higher bytes in memory. I would have written this the other way around, but this is the way they've written it. So this is the, so if you address byte 1000, this is byte 1000, perhaps byte 1001, 1002, and so forth. Uh, so that's what we're talking about. So the opcode is at the low address. It's a, it's a little Endian machine like the PDP-11. Now the instruction format consists of an opcode, which can be one or two bytes. That should give you pause right there. One byte means you can have 256 instructions, theoretically. Two bytes means you can have a lot more. So um, it did have a one or two byte instruction code here, opcode, and um, there were a lot of instruction codes. One of the things that's difficult to compare between different architectures is uh, when you say, well, how many instructions did it have? How many instructions did, a, uh, say, an IBM mainframe, which was another popular machine at the time, have? In the IBM mainframe, um, for example, the add instruction, there's several add instructions, but one of them is the um, AR instruction. It adds two 32-bit quantities. And the other, another add instruction is the A instruction. It also adds two 32-bit quantities. The difference between the two of them is that the AR has both of its operands in registers, whereas the A, one of the operands is in a register, the other is in memory. It's really just an addressing mode difference. Uh, they are the same instruction. In the uh, in the VAX, oh, it would be called just an add instruction, uh, and also in the PDB-11, but there would be many possible addressing modes up to, uh, well, this, of course, on the, on the PDB-11, there are eight addressing modes, and then if you add a PC relative or program counter relative, there's far more. <coughs> likewise here. So um, exact counts may be um, deceptive. Uh, the count on a, P on a VAX or a PDP-11 is actually much lower than an equivalent count on, say, a mainframe. Anyway, um, the opcode specifier, uh, depending upon, uh, depending upon the, um, the, in, the instruction, the operands, they're one or more operands. Operands can have additional data with them. They can have extended um, words that are attached to each, uh, to an operand. Um, the operand is um, basically similar to it was on the PDP-11 in that there is a mode byte, and it consists of a mode number, which is uh, 4 bits, and a register number, which is 4 bits, hence 16 registers, 16 addressing modes. All right, so that's your mode byte. That's very similar to the PDP-11, which had the same thing, except these were um, 3 bits each. 
um, reflecting eight registers and eight modes. Uh, these are four bits each reflecting 16 registers and 16 modes. Anyway, depending upon the mode and the register, there may be additional information attached to it, displacements and so forth. Uh, so there are zero or more bytes after, uh, after the uh, after the specification. So an instruction on a VAX again looks somewhat similar to a PDP-11 and though we've got an opcode. Now in the PDP-11 the opcodes were kind of sprinkled across the instruction. Uh, there were additional bits. It wasn't a nice clean boundary. But with the uh, VAX it was a one byte or two byte opcode. Um, then one or more operand specifiers. And each of the operand specifiers consists of a mode byte which is um, the addressing mode and the register number, possibly additional information depending upon the mode. Now here's some examples of some instructions. The first instruction is the clear word. Word on a VAX is still 16 bits. It's a two byte entity. Long is for 32 uh, bits or four bytes. Now uh, the clear instruction only has one operand because um, that's all it has. It's got zeros out the uh, target. Now the target here is, the, uh, the address of the target in memory is in register 5 and it's auto decrement. And since it's a 2 byte quantity, the value in register 5 will be decremented by 2. The value pointed to by register 5 in memory will be zeroed. The instruction looks like this. The opcode is B4, hexadecimal of course. Uh, then there's the mode byte for the only, uh, for the only uh, um, operand. There's no additional information. And the mode is 7, which is auto decrement, and the register is register 5. Now here is an add instruction, add long 2. The 2 means it's got two operands. There is a three operand add instruction as well, where you've got an A plus B and the result is in C. In this case here, the value pointed to by register 10 will be added to the contents of register 7 and the result will remain in register 7. This is auto increment mode, similar, very similar to the PDP-11. Since it's long, in other words, 32 bits or 4 bytes, the value in register 10 will be, um, will be incremented by 4 uh, after the instruction and after the addition takes place. Uh, and what it looks like in memory, there's the opcode C0 for an add L2. Uh, the first operand is mode 8. Um, uh, which is auto increment um, on register 10, A being, of course, register 10 in hexadecimal. And then the second operand is uh, mode 5, which means the uh, operand is in the register, and the register in question is register 7. So we will add the contents um, of memory pointed to by register 10 to the value in register 7, leaving the result in register 7. Then we will increment the value in register 10 by 4. Here, is the, uh, here are the addressing modes on a VAX 11. There's quite a few of them. Several of them are identical to the PDP-11. Some others are new, but uh, there's the basic register mode. The operand is in the register, registered deferred. The register points to the operand. Auto increment, auto decrement, byte displacement, word displacement, um, where word is 16 bits. Long word displacement, where that's 32 bits displacement relative to a register. Literal is a, um, it's, it's a number is 0 through 3. The first two bits are 0, 0. Therefore, it's a literal. Uh, the remaining six bits, where there would be parts of the mode and the register, the remaining six, six bits are the, quote, literal. And so if you have a program that's, um, say, adding 5, uh, the literal would be 5. Sm for small numbers, you would put them in as the literal. That you, There would be no need to address memory to get a value of, say, 5, or whatever it is you're adding or multiplying or subtracting by. Uh, it, would it, would, it would take those six bits um, and it would extend the value into the appropriate size. So if it's an add instruction that's adding two long words or two 32-bit quantities and one of them is a literal, it'll take those six, uh, those, um, those six bits and it'll extend them out to 32 bits. Uh, it was based on analysis of, of programs where programs were seen to be using a lot of small constants and rather than fetching these constants from memory, um, using, uh, using, having them write in the instruction uh, was deemed um, worthwhile. Uh, branch instructions, both a 8-bit and a 16-bit displacement. Then you have the program counter modes. So you take the regular modes and you, you make the, um, 
the object register, the program counter, you get uh, exotic modes, which we went into with the PDP-11. Um, and they get even a little more exotic with the VAX. And then there's some more here um, on table 8.1 continued. Again, this is from Sarah Bass's book that I mentioned earlier. So it had an awful lot of addressing modes um, and an awful lot of instructions. And again, the problem with the machine was it was too complicated. It was brilliant. If you were writing an assembly language, you could, you could take advantage of absolutely everything. But by that time, in the late 70s, going into the 80s, fewer and fewer people were writing an assembly language. Um, more and more people were using high-level languages. And the high-level languages, the compilers could never take advantage of all this stuff. You could even write your own instructions in the machine. Some of the instructions was a polynomial evaluate, which had a uh, variable number of arguments. I forget. It was, I don't even know if there was an upper limit. But you know, some of these instructions were subroutines. The machine um, was microprogrammed. And I remember when I had ran a 780 lab back at the time. When you powered it up in the morning, um, you would hear clicking. And the clicking would be it was reading the microcode off of a, uh, off of a floppy disk. A large floppy disk, and you could you could actually write your own instructions um, for the machine. Well, you know this is of no value to a compiler writer, and this is about the time RISC architecture machines in the 80s and so forth started to become. There were a lot of RISC architectures, such as the Spark from Sun Microsystems. Um, a lot of them came uh, came out right about then. The IBM Power PC and so forth, and that was the trend. As a matter of fact, digital. Um, pretty much abandoned after in the after about 10 years the VAX and went to the Alpha, which was a RISC architecture. The CISC architecture was um, was brilliant in one sense, but it was effectively unusable. You could never get all of its power. It was a lot of features that were mainly went unused. It had, like I mentioned earlier, I think uh, an extremely exotic um, virtual memory system. Uh, that again um, was kind of put out of business by the fact that memory got cheaper and cheaper and bigger and bigger. The um, you, you have to make, make a comment on virtual memory. On the um, PDP-11, the word virtual memory meant, meant something different than in the VAX. On the PDP-11, it was um, where the address space was 16 bits. Uh, they and, and but you say you had a machine and 16 bits would be a 64k machine. But if you had a machine with a megabyte on it, which in those days was fairly large, um, they referred to that megabyte as virtual memory. You could remap, you could map the addressing space anywhere up into that uh, million bytes of memory. And that's what they referred to. Um, that activity was called virtual memory. In the VAX, it was the, uh, the way IBM uses it or other, com other manufacturers, in that the, um, the address space was bigger than the physical space. So if you had an eight megabyte uh, VAX, you could have a virtual address space that was, you know, theoretically four billion bytes. In actual fact, it was a four billion byte address space, but it was uh, mapped oddly. Uh, the largest uh, user virtual program was only about a quarter of that, about a gigabyte. But that was um, th that was what they meant by virtual. In other words, virtual in the VAX and most machines nowadays means that the um, means that the address space. Um, is smaller than the uh, is larger than the uh, physical space, whereas on the PDP-11 it was the other way around.